the, the space aviation wise. So on Friday, there was an unfortunate accident in Ukraine involving an Anson of aircraft carrying cadets. And unfortunately, 22 of those on board passed. Um, it's truly tragic and we're hopeful for the best for the families and that future incidents can be avoided. So that's just major news that's really happening right now in the space. So we're gonna dive now into the session. Our guest presenter is uh, someone who is not a stranger. He has given a presentation already during the summer on Airbus and his experiences flying. So our presenter for today is Damar Walker from Air, Can from Air, Air Canada, who will be elaborating on the topic, automation, the good, the bad, and the future. So Damar, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. All right, thanks for the intro. Hope everyone is doing well. I'm just gonna get my screen shared up here. And there we go. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully, you can give me thumbs up. Uh, Hasana, you can hear me all right? Yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're talking about uh, automation. Um, the Airbus pilot talking about automation. I think that gives me enough qualification, I guess, to, to talk about uh, this uh, topic. And I mentioned here the good, because there are lots of good, um, the bad and the future. And there's a question mark there, because what does a future um, with automation look like? Um, in some aspects, uh, this is a build on the presentation that I did in the summer regarding uh, the Airbus. Um, just talking about some of the automation systems that are on that aircraft, but this is also a deeper dive into automation uh, history and how automation uh, exists as it is right now, um, how we've lived with it and how um, they're proposing uh, automation and what it's gonna look like in the future. So what are we talking about? Um, I'll give you a brief uh, intro bio um, for those in the uh, group today that um, may not be familiar with me, just to share my background, where I'm at now in my career and how I got there. We'll be talking a little bit about automation history with uh, an overview. We're gonna be talking about the good and the bad uh, with respect to automation. Uh, pilot less future, um, that's a question. So we'll be discussing that. Amicable coexistence, can we uh, exist in an automation world in unison with pilots and computers? And uh, some future tech that's just on the horizon. And obviously, there's going to be questions, and we can have a nice uh, discussion here this afternoon. So, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Damar Walker. Uh, I'm in an Air Canada Airbus A320 first officer, and I've been in this uh, current position since March of uh, 2018. Um, I've been at both Mainline and uh, Air Canada. Uh, started at Mainline, went, uh, sorry, Mainline and Rouge. I started at Mainline, went to Rouge, and now I'm back at uh, Air Canada. So you know the story, I'm Jamaican born. Uh, Richard Gordon was mentioning he lives in Spanish Town. That's where I was born. Um, went on a 747, very young, and fell in love with flying, and it, the rest is really history. Uh, went to the University of Western Ontario, have a bachelor's degree in uh, management and organizational studies in commercial aviation management with a minor in geography. Um, joined the military in my second uh, year of uh, university, spent 12 years in the Air Force, retired from the Air Force in 2017 um, as a combat ready instructor pilot on the CC-130J. Uh, after the military, I was at WestJet Encore, where I was a first officer for a few short months. And now, as mentioned, I'm at uh, Air Canada, living the dream or, in quotations, the nightmare based on uh, COVID. But overall, even with everything going on, I still say this is the best uh, job career uh, in the world. So question and um, someone I guess can unmute their mic uh, to answer. What is automation? Don't be shy. Does anyone want to take a stab at what automation is? I'll take a go if nobody else wants to go. 
All right, go ahead, Jafran. Automation would be the replacement of a task done by human power with the with the use of computers. Yeah, that's that's good. And uh, I would note that it doesn't even have to be computers because there's some mechanical uh, systems where you can put a series of gears and pulleys together that can uh, automate uh, simplistic uh, uh, tasks. And we've seen that in the industrial rev revolution with you know mass production. So I would go a little bit further. That was a great uh, definition there, but I'd say it's the utilization of different control systems and technologies to reduce the requirement of human interference. So some parts of the equation where uh, a man was doing a certain task, but now you take technology, whether that's a computer or mechanics, and now you introduce uh, the ability for that form of technology to take over something that a human used to do. Um, so with the improvement and advancement of technology, we've seen, techno um, seen automation, sorry, uh, creep into various industries. So um, this is not unique to aviation. In medicine, we have automation on the records keeping side of the house, on life support equipment. In the financial world, any accountants or business people in here, we know that there's accounting software and tools that's readily available, some uh, that are consumer friendly to help us with our budgeting. Um, and then back to aviation on the ATC side of things, we've seen advancements with uh, air traffic control. So, um, you know, strips that used to be manually written out, they have electronic strips now. There's weather radar overlays, trajectory and conflict uh, predictions. So we've seen how technology has uh, entered into different industries um, and, and automated some aspects that were, were done um, by humans. So I wanna make a distinction here, and I'm gonna make a bold statement. You're gonna to have to stick with me for this one um, and say that automation does not necessarily mean autopilot. But I'm gonna flip that equation around and say that the autopilot does equal automation. So if you give me a chance to explain this, when, when you say automation, people automatically assume that we're talking about autopilot. And although, that is a form of automation, it is singular. Um, it's one uh, aspect that is automated uh, in aviation. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of different forms of automation that exist in aviation that have no relation to autopilot. And we'll eventually get up to some of the automation that maybe you'd be a little bit more familiar with. So a few automated forms. One of the things uh, here is uh, takeoff performance. So if you fly a small airplane, you may not have to calculate your takeoff performance all the time. Your weight range is very small. So, you know, you probably always rotate at 60 knots. Um, as the airplanes get bigger, more advanced, um, have wider weight range, different runway conditions uh, and environments, you need to start calculating all this stuff. And I remember when I used to have to calculate all this stuff, it was a very manual process. We had tables, charts, graphs. Now we get a load information sheet from our company. We're able to go into something uh, in the aircraft uh, called the uh, ACARS, which is uh, Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. It's like text message where we can send messages back and forth uh, between the airplane and the company. We put all the load data information in there along with temperature, pressure, uh, winds, a whole bunch of other parameters. And it spits out a form like this that you see here. And it shows us different scenarios. If we have a no wind situation, which we will really use, uh, if we have a five knot, which is not shown here, headwind situation or a 10 uh, knot headwind situation. And then it gives us all of our settings for our power. Um, based on the weight, we have some tolerance on the weight and then all of our rotation our V1 speeds, our rotation speeds, and our uh, climb out safety speed for people who are not flying uh, jet uh, aircraft that's similar, the V2 is similar to what your blue line uh, would be. But you see in this situation here um, where uh, automation has taken something that was very, uh, very manual process, taken out some of the human uh, interface and interaction to, you know, help make the job easier. So that's one form. Uh, another form is uh, digital ATIS. Um, I don't know if any of you have listened to ATIS uh, over the radio at airports that have a digital ATIS frequency, but to be honest, if you don't have the equipment to decode this and print it off a printer or like what I've done here is taking it off my uh, iPad, um, it's a very robotic sounding voice. 
Um, and I used to hate it when I couldn't decode it. But now that I fly the Airbus and we have uh, a system where we can punch in information and get the digital ATIS, it's absolutely invaluable because now I don't need to be in VHF uh, range to get the ATIS. I can, if I'm flying to Kingston, I can print out the Kingston ATIS in Toronto. I know exactly what's going on. It's printed out for me. I'm not listening to lines and lines of information, some information that I don't find relevant over and over and over again, um, not having to decode anything. It's all there written out for me. Um, and this is great in the sense that it relieves me of having to do this because before if you needed to be in range of ATIS, you're in the terminal environment, you're, you're descending, you're running through checklists, you're dealing with so many other things, you're, it's busier on the radio. So now with digital ATIS and being able to decode this information in advance, um, this is a form of automation that has uh, helped uh, to make the job easier in that respect. Um, for those that were in my Airbus presentation uh, earlier this summer, um, talked a lot about uh, the speed tape and that's another form of automation that's great, um, is before all these speeds that you see on the speed tape uh, needed to be calculated. So they'd all be static and they'd be based on a wide uh, weight range. Whereas with aircraft like the Airbus that have a dynamic speed tape, um, all the information is presented live in real time. Um, Cause with the airplane that has varying weights and um, varying uh, configurations, all these speeds are gonna be constantly changing. What's my VX? How do I get the best angle of climb? In the Airbus, simple, pull back on the stick all the way until the speed touches just at V alpha max there. And you know, based on the coefficient of lift right there and you see where alpha is, that at that point in time, I'm getting the maximum amount of lift. So in dynamic situations, say uh, terrain avoidance or um, if I need to do a go around or anything that is involved, you know, very dynamic uh, maneuvering, I'm not calculating any of this. This is done for me in, in real time. Um, All right, and then, one minute, Damar. Um, yeah, I see ahead. Amr's hand up. Amr, you can yeah. unmute your mic. Um, what exactly is the ages? Sorry, go, go, go ahead again. I didn't hear what you said. What exactly is ATIS? You were talking about ATIS, but I don't understand what it is. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I threw out an argument. That's uh, my apologies. With uh, aviation, sometimes you throw out um, information or acronyms um, that people don't understand, but it's an uh, aerodrome uh, traffic information system. If someone can correct me on that. Um, it's essentially just a broadcast of the airport, current airport weather within a five nautical mile range of the airport. And that may vary based on the different country or aviation rules that uh, you're, you're using. But it's just a brief readout of what the weather at the airport is, uh, the cloud condition, um, any relevant NOTAMs that could be affecting taxiways or, or runways. It just gives the pilots the information that they need to you know have the performance uh, calculations for you know winds or temperature uh, dew point and all the other critical information that the pilots need on an at least an hourly basis oh i see thank you <laughs> you're welcome question. what did you say that speed was that um involved the coefficient to lift it was it, it was that like your best glide speed or something no, uh, the alpha max would be more uh, akin to uh, VX, which would be a best angle. Oh, okay. Just, just prior to stall. All right, um, I see another hand up under the name iPhone. Could you please unmute and ask a question? Hi, um, yeah, Matthew Samuels here in Florida. Yeah, uh, recently just got a, just did a private pilot and I passed the written. And I'm just wondering, um, are the VORs, the VORs, like the navigation needs, are they automated as well, all the way? What aspect of them automated? What do you mean? I'm not sure I understand. Like, um, since it's, all right, you know, like um, in the cockpit, when you have the um, omni receiver needle and it points, mm -hmm. you know, like it, you know how it goes to or from, or it goes from or to, you know, the, um, the flex. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I was just wondering, I was wondering if the VOR stations, I was just wondering if they're automated too. Well, the VOR. Be a source of automation. 
Um, the VORs themselves are not automated. They're still, no. um, but the airplane and how it decodes the VOR information, like my aircraft is, uh, we, we never have to hard tune any of the VORs. It, it, all the VORs are in a database, but it uses the VOR information on top of GPS information to help, you know, position uh, the aircraft. So just how the aircraft determines the information or decodes the information that the VOR is given could be automated. Because I don't need to, unless I'm flying a specific course, I don't need to turn an uh, OBI or OBS or anything like that in order to um, find out the radial that I'm on. Like that happens automatically. Um, whereas in some airplanes, that's a manual process where you have to you know, line up what your heading is and a lot more manual, whereas a lot of that is automated on some of the newer aircraft. Oh, so you're saying that, all right, so the VOR is, um, it's mainly, it's not automated, but it's more manual. It's the airplane that makes it automated. Yeah, so the VOR is, is, is still the same same system. Right, it's um, under it's under GPS. The VOR, no, the VOR is a ground no. base. I know it's a ground base. Is, I know it's a ground base, but. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. And the ADSB? ADSB. So uh, ADSB is just is a whole different form of uh, reporting, um, and uh, it's autonomous broadcast system. Uh, ADSB autonomous autonomous digital. I, I don't even know what what it stands for, <laughs> to be honest. But um, the ADSB system is is a whole another form where now I can send information to other aircraft and they can send information back. We, we can send information to ground stations and they can send information back. So what it does is it kind of makes each airplane its, its own entity in its sense. So I can see traffic information on my displays based on the information that I'm receiving and obtaining uh, from other aircraft, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, thanks. You're welcome. So, um, Damar, just to just help you a bit, ADSB is automatic dependent surveillance yes, broadcast. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Awesome. So, are there any more questions before we continue? All right. Cool. Damar, you can continue. All right. So, um, fuel management, and we're we're going to talk about a few systems here, and then we'll we'll move on. But fuel management is another aspect uh, that gets a little bit more complicated on larger category aircraft. When I used to fly the CC-130J, because the airplane is so heavy and takes so much fuel, you get these bending moments in the wings, right? So you're carrying all this fuel. You have to keep all the heavier fuel on the outside of the wings to help keep them from bending up. So that was a manual process uh, on the Hercules. So we always had to monitor, make sure we're maintaining a specific differential between the outer and inner tanks. Moving over to the A320, um, now there's an automatic system in place that does exactly what I used to have to do on the Hercules, um, where if you look on this diagram, you'll see the inner tanks are at 1780, and this is in uh, kilograms. So when the inner tanks burn down to 750 kilograms on the A320, there's an outflow valve that opens for the outer tanks where you see the 220 kilograms of fuel and they allow the fuel to freely move. So this system of fuel management, another form of automation, is now helping to assist in a task that was very manual before to ensure that the wind, the wind doesn't have uh, unfavorable uh, bending moments. I think someone's off mute still. Oh. Sorry. Um, um, yeah, this, this one, I'll uh, a lot of people will find uh, a little bit interesting and probably didn't know existed. Um, when I used to fly the Herc, um, we used to fly in formation. And a lot of people may not know, but aircraft are capable of flying automation on, or flying formation on automation. So CAPSKI in this respect, it's a coordinated air positioning system, station keeping equipment, it's a mouthful. Um, I'm able to enter a, all the parameters that I want with a whole bunch of aircraft and the airplane will maintain and fly in formation automatically. Um, it's, like I said, it's very input intensive. Um, it's not perfect, it does have its drawbacks, but 
in a situation where you're flying information for long periods of time on complex missions, this form of automation was great in terms of relieving you from having to hand fly uh, the automation, or sorry, the aircraft on your own. The automation really helped in that respect. So you see that um, if you look on the screen here, you can actually see a circle right here. And this is the other aircraft. This is the aircraft that we're in right now. So we're using this automation. This was actually hand flown because the automation would kick off. It wouldn't want to fly such an aggressive maneuver um, with, the, uh, with the autopilot uh, on. But we've enabled it so that now it's a tool, so we know the distance and spacing that we want to maintain from the other aircraft. And this is our aircraft. This shows the trajectory of how we're catching up to the other aircraft. But if we were in straight and level flight, we could put this airplane back in that circle, turn the automatics on, and the air this our airplane would follow the other one. So just to show you some of the advancements uh, there in terms of what automation is capable of doing. Um, last thing I want to talk about before we move on to the history is um, Flap auto retract. And I, I put this in mostly for Jafaz because I think uh, I briefly touched on it um, in, a, in a presentation. I think he was so fascinated uh, by it that I just wanted to elaborate on it a little bit more. But there are, again, when you're flying an airplane that has such a different uh, weight uh, ranges, um, when you're on the heavier portion of uh, that weight range, there comes a critical point where you have flaps out and slots out. But if you raise the flaps, too early or if you raised both the flaps and the slots at the same time the airplane would be too slow for that speed based on the weight so and and if you um if you did it too late then you'd be going faster than the flaps or or, or slots are suited to be so what airbus has done with the system on the a320 and it's even more critical on the a321 is they've created a system where once you're up accelerating at heavier weights um, and you get above 210 knots to help so the pilots don't have to do this on their own. It retracts the flaps, keeps the slots out, and then you're able to accelerate through the flap restrictive speed. And then once you're faster than the slot retraction speed, then you're able to retract the flaps on your own. And you can see um, this diagram gives a full logic of the system in terms of how it functions. And when you're on the ground, you're uh, at flap zero and you're less than or equal to 100 knots because you're, you're not moving. So you put the flaps to one and you're going to get flop one plus F, which is one plus F just means you're getting slats plus flaps. Whereas if you're in the air, you're greater than 100 knots, you'll see if you put the flaps from zero to one, you're only getting flaps one. But on the reverse, if you're at flaps two, and you go to flops one, if you're less than 210 knots, you're gonna get one plus F. If you're greater, then you're gonna get flops one. And then here you can see the relationship where if your airspeed is greater than or equal to 210 knots, it, it automatically goes from one plus F to one. So I mean, maybe a little bit confusing for the first time seeing it, but it just shows you uh, how the automation works with flight augmentation uh, systems to help assist uh, the pilot. So, um, as I mentioned, even though automation has crept into many different industries, it's had its uh, place in aviation for a lot longer um, than people think. Um, just shortly after we've had powered flight, um, the most basic of autopilots existed shortly thereafter. And to today's world where, you know, where we have automation that's capable of managing most uh, aspects of flight. So, in order to, from us, for us to have gotten from where we started to where we are now, there were some key developments uh, that occurred. And there's four in particular um, that I wanna take a closer look at 
that have allowed us to get to where we are, where airplanes are able and, and, and capable of doing uh, what they're doing. So the first thing we'll talk about is the first autopilot. Now, before I give the answer away, I just want to kind of gauge, and someone other than Jafaz or Richard or Hassana, um, can someone tell me uh, when they think the first autopilot was introduced? Just a year, if the first autopilot. Um, I would say in the 1900s or late 1800s. Okay, so okay. we have, it wouldn't be 1800s because the first flight was in 19, first powered flight was in 1903. So what, just a specific date, if you could pick a date, what would you say? All right, 1956. 1956, okay, anyone else? Somebody say 1923. 1923. I'd like to guess. Who, uh, oh, some, someone, someone said 1912. Who was that? Chris, 1912. 1949? 1913. It was 1970. Okay, so someone said 1912. 2020. 1949. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, I think I got, I think I got a few. Um, there was one right answer in that. Um, if that was Chris, not, not surprised. Um, 1912. Um, and that's that's surprising um, by you know a lot of people because you've mentioned autopilot 1912. It's like wow, that's a long time ago. But uh, yes, autopilots have existed since 1912, um, and back then it was called a gyroscopic automatic uh, pilot, and they use a device similar to this with some gyroscopes and pitch and yaw to help. Uh, steer the aircraft based on a compass specific course. There wasn't anything uh, mechanical linked to the ailerons. The, what they'd do is they'd build in uh, dihedral uh, in the wings. For those that don't know what dihedral, in, uh, dihedral is, it's a form of stability. So when you look at a wing and you see that the wing is almost angled, the tips of the wings are almost angled up from the neutral plane, that would be dihedral. When they're angled down from the neutral plane, that would be anhedral. So angled up dihedral produces inherent stability, whereas anhedral produces inherent instability. So they'd use the dihedral uh, aspect of the wing uh, for roll stability. But it's interesting to note that autopilots have been around since 1912. So that's the first development and a key development because the airplane needs to be able to control itself. Next thing is auto throttles. Anyone want to guess a year for that? I'll take probably like two or three, see if we can get this one on the button. 1920? 1915. 1915, okay. Anyone else? Say it's somewhere around one of the world wars. Okay. So yeah, 1917 kind of area. 1917, okay. All right, so I, I like the thinking with respect to the world wars because as you know, aviation has advanced greatly um, during the world wars. So World War I had a lot of advancements, not so much in, the, in terms of automatics, but World War II, we started to see a lot more. We see the jet engine introduced uh, there. And we also see the Messerschmitt ME-262 was the first uh, recorded auto thrust system. I've looked up this system to try and see what its actual capabilities were. Nothing too specific. I don't know if Chris is on, online. Maybe he'll know a little bit more in terms of what that auto thrust system was able to do. But that's the first time they've noted uh, some form of auto throttles in an aircraft. But more noted in terms of in, in terms of commercial use was in uh, 1956, and that was on the DC-3, and that system was called Auto Power, and uh, it was based it's uh, almost like an alpha system similar to um, what what they have on uh, newer aircraft, where it was primarily used on approach, wasn't based on airspeed, but it was based on 1.3 VSO, which is basically that's that's an alpha it's based on um, angle of attack so the aircraft would change the power settings to maintain at least 1.3 times uh, above the uh, stall speed and the system became more advanced later on to have something called a voter system because they know humans we make mistakes so with the voter system uh, it 
would take the input from what the pilot selected as a speed. It would know what 1.3 VSO is. So VSO, simplest way to explain that is uh, velocity, uh, SO with your stuff out. So that's in a full configuration. Um, so 1.3 VSO, 1.3 times the stall speed. And it would never allow the pilot to select a speed that was lower than VSO. So even though the auto throttle system was introduced in, uh, or first commercial use of auto throttle system was introduced in the DC-3 in 1956, we didn't really see a catch on till later in, in later on, later years when speed um, became uh, attached and not just dealing with uh, alpha. So that's uh, uh, system advancement number two. So now we have an autopilot, so the plane can, um, can control itself. We have auto throttles. So now we have two pieces of technology, they come together and now they're able to combine them and the plane not can only, cannot only fly itself, but it can control its speed. So now we're able to do a little bit more fine tune things like landing. And can anyone guess what year um, was the first recorded auto land? 1950. 1950. No, it was in 1960. Yeah, 19. I have the date of 1964 on a Trident. Um, and the first commercial use was in 1965. So I'll take a pause here and just, just think about that. Um, and, and I think it's important to talk about this when we're talking about automation and advancement in technology. It's a accumulation of different technologies. It's not overnight. There are different things that need to be refined. And we'll talk more about that later on. And once these different elements are refined, then they can kind of put it all together to make some magic happen. Um, and as well, it's interesting to note how long some of these systems have been out. People see, you know, an A320 being able to do auto land in the 1980s and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Planes are gonna fly themselves in a year but they don't realize that these systems have been around for a long time. And it, it's more than just one piece of technology. It's, it's a whole bunch of technology coming together. So we see Autoland introduced in uh, 1964. And even though the airplane was capable to do it back then, it was not very good at doing it outside of still air. So that's kind of counterproductive in the sense that, yeah, you have, you know, uh, stable air sometimes with fog and stuff that sticks around, but sometimes you're in bad weather and it's, it's not the smoothest of air. So it's like, okay, you need the stars to align in order to use this. Um, on my airplane, the Airbus A320, we have a lot more liberal uh, limitations um, with respect to our auto land. We're capable up to category 3B, not 00, zero as a category 3C would be. So we need some RVR, at least 250 foot uh, uh, RVR, and uh, in order to, to perform this landing. We have liberal limitations in, in the sense that we can have up to 15 knots crosswind, uh, 10 knot tailwind, and up to 30 knots uh, of headwind. So we have some leeway to, to play with. Um, still very involved system. It's, it's not uh, at altitude, push one button and everything happens, got to tune a lot of different things you need there's strict air crew requirements aircraft requirements and airfield requirements but the airplane is able in bad weather to fully land itself put the nose down um, and you stop on the runway you have to actually disconnect the autopilot in order to be able to steer it uh, on on the ground so i just want to watch this video and it's showing you a demonstration of the trident uh, doing uh <laughs> Even today, the Trident, fitted with Autoland, was to become the world's first commercial airliner able to land in fog. Test pilots Ron Clear and Jimmy Phillips demonstrated an Autoland approach into Hatfield. Over to the pilot. We are now lined up on the ILS beam uh, in line with the runway. We're descending down the glide path and we have completed the checklist. That is, we have lowered the undercarriage flaps and made all the actions necessary to carry out an automatic landing. Ron Clear, one of our senior test pilots, is acting as co-pilot for this flight, and he is monitoring the performance of the system. 
uh, normally, for an operational approach, uh, both pilots would be doing this job. At the moment, we're passing uh, 450 feet on the radio altimeters, and this means that we have approximately a mile and a half to run to touchdown. The autopilot is controlling the airplane, the flight path of the airplane, and the automatic throttles on the two outboard engines are controlling the speed of the airplane. We're now passing 200 feet with three quarters of a mile to run. The landing will commence at 65 feet, at which point the throttles will close and the autopilot will pitch the nose of the airplane up for the landing flare. The flare is now beginning and we should very shortly be touching down round about now. So as you can see there with the uh, Autoland uh, system there, um, yeah, airplane, 1960s airplane, fully capable of, of landing, uh, landing itself. Awesome stuff. Uh, one minute, I see Amri's hand is up. Yeah, go ahead. So is it standard nowadays for pilots to use auto landing? Standard. So, no, um, because I think Jafaz had asked me this uh, at the beginning of the presentation before anyone was in the room. He's like, have you, have you ever done an auto land? And I'm, I've been on the airplane for two and a half years and never done one uh, in, the, in the airplane. Because the thing is, if you're going to do an auto land, you need to tell the airport that you're doing, they need to protect a certain aspect of the airfield. There's different hold short lines uh, that need to be uh, protected. Um, in order for the system to to function properly, and the Autoland system, like I was explaining to Jafaz as well, is is not designed for a finesse landing. You know, it's not a, a greaser. Oh my gosh, that was the most beautiful eye-watering landing I've ever seen. It's it's a no nonsense, get the airplane down on the ground um, type of system. So, not standard at all. Um, and also, if you think about it as well based on the type of weather that it's certified down to. If you're experiencing weather like that, most likely you're gonna end up diverting. So there's, there's very few situations where you've diverted and then now you're using the auto land to get the airplane down on the ground. We have a lot more uh, systems in place to prevent getting to a point where we have to use it. So it's, it's not standard at all. Uh, it's so, capable, but not standard. So what, in what situations would it be used? Uh, it would be used in a situation, like I said, where you probably have diverted uh, to a different aircraft or different airfield and uh, the weather at your alternate is, is lower than expected or say you filed, uh, there's no uh, airports within the vicinity that make sense or they're closed and you need to, there's emergency situation, you need to get down on uh, the airfield that's within vicinity and then, you know, by all means, you have the ability to do an auto land, but it's not uh, something that we're just going to use just because. Oh, all right, then. Thank you. So it's for emergencies, essentially. Uh, it's not necessarily for emergencies. I wouldn't go that far, but it's, it's, it's discretionary uh, use. There's very specific uh, scenarios where uh, you, would, you would use the auto land. It's not something where I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to do an auto land uh, today. Um, it's, they're very, very specific situations, low weather, bad weather, maybe a diverse situation. Uh, where you're going to be using the auto land. All right, then. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so another oh, technology. Wait, in hold on, Dadamar. Um, I think I see, I think it's Matthew. I don't, I'm sorry. I, I'm not remembering his name right now, but he had his hand up a while ago. I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah, so. That's I me. Didn't... Okay. Hi. Yeah, it's me again, Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so all I mean between Boeing and Airbus, as well as Cessna, Airbus is the most automated in terms of. I heard that all Airbus systems for landing, Airbus systems are automated for landing, and you only and the only thing for the scent, landing for the scent, and you flare the pilot flares. You only, you only lands with flare touchdown, but the landing, the descent is automated. That's true. No, that's uh, who told who told you who told you that. <laughs> um, my professor when I was at college, uh, he he was a he was a captain for American Airlines, and he flew the A three hundred. 
Their A three hundred's even worse. <laughs> They're worse. Yeah, it's not even it's it's old generation Airbus. It's not even new Airbus. No, um, the I don't understand where he says it's automated. It's an Airbus would fly a descent like a Boeing would fly a descent. We could fly it on autopilot. Most times we're flying the descent on autopilot. Um, land we, for me personally, I I like taking the autopilot off on final and I'm flying it. I'm flying the approach. Um, it's not just a flare. So I'm not sure what he meant by that. Maybe it was misunderstood what he was saying. Oh, yeah, that's true. And it's not, there's no real difference between an, an FMS based or um, like that's what the Boeing term would be an FMS based uh, aircraft or a McDo based uh, aircraft. They're all going to fly very similarly. Uh, for me, the minimum altitude that I have to engage the autopilot is a hundred feet before I can engage the autopilot and I can fly using the McDo um, all the way up to altitude and also using uh, the different mode control panel uh, to, to fly the airplane up to altitude and then I can descent on the automatics as well and I can disconnect at uh, 200 feet but um, it's not any different between Airbus or Boeing and when you disconnect the autopilot you're flying it's not an automated process if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah. All right. I got it. So, so there's the a lot. There's a, so, there's a, yeah. I'm surprised. I'm surprised if that came from an Airbus uh, guy because there's a lot of misconceptions um, with right. the Airbus in terms of how it flies. It's, it's still an airplane. It's an airplane, an airplane, an airplane. Yes, it's a fully fly by wire uh, aircraft, but at the end of the day, it's still an airplane. Pull back to go up, push down to go forward, left and right. Like it's, it's still. Right. The basics of an airplane are still there. It's not robotic in any means. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Could I, could I say something? Go ahead. Um, in today's world where there's Airbus versus Boeing, people need to realize that these technology they're using are borrowed. And they were basically pioneered by other aircraft that these youngsters may not know about and should we should have them do some research and presentation. Ahead. But you guys should look into McDonnell Douglas, the company that was bought by Boeing. And then you realize that even the technology that Boeing has was once someone else's technology. And auto throttle was McDonnell Douglas, auto land, auto braking. All these things were pioneered in that company. And you realize that. So in the world of Boeing versus um, Airbus, the, the true aviators will know about the real companies who build these systems. Company like Honeywell and um, Rayton and, and the, the others, you know? Alice. So you guys can look it up. But um, Demar, thank you for doing a very good presentation. I'll ask you guys to, let's try to keep the questions to minimum so we can have the presentation and then we can ask the questions after. Um, let's not get distracted too far, all right? Thank you. Perfect. So does that answer your question? Make sense? Okay, I guess he's gone. Um, so yeah, so fly by wire. This is the. the oh no, I'm here, man. Okay, so you're good. Question was yeah, good. I'm good, man. Okay, yeah, awesome. they're all borrowed. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, yeah. it, it's all planes of planes of plane. Um, but yeah, so the fly-by-wire uh, system, uh, this was, is another key development. And in its simplest form, uh, not necessarily how it exists today, but in its simplest form uh, can be traced back to the 1930s, um, where we've seen it on uh, Tupolev. And then we can also see uh, various military applications uh, as a Canadian proud with the Avro Aero. Um, and then we can see its introduction into commercial service in the 1960s, late 1960s on an analog scale with the Concorde. And then later on on the airplane I'm flying uh, right now, the Airbus A320 in the 1980s on a digital uh, application. So I mentioned all of these different systems because these four key developments play, all played a role. It's just like what Chris was saying, these all played a role in the overall capabilities of what the aircraft can do today. Because now you have autopilot, you have auto throttles, auto land, fly by wire, you've really set up a platform where now you can take the automation to the absolute uh, next level. 
one key distinction that I want to make, though, um, before we delve too deep into this, and I think maybe this had part to do with your question that you had asked uh, there before, is that automated, automated does not mean autonomous. And um, in the beginning of the presentation, I asked, what is automation? And sometimes we can get mixed up to think that there needs to be some form of computer involved to make something automated, but mechanical systems can aid in automation without any brain or computer. So automated does not necessarily mean um, uh, autonomous. Um, I have a Mavic uh, 2 uh, Pro here. Uh, if anyone owns one of these drones, this is the best way that I can describe what automation is like today and, and how it's evolving. Because certain levels of autonomy, so there's some autonomy that's there and it's being introduced. So, you know, you push a button, it takes off. Push a button, it lands. It will do obstacle avoidance. It will climb above an obstacle or come to a stop. But at the heart of it, you still, there's a human interacting. It has these autonomous functions, but still it's not fully uh, autonomous because in these cases, it still requires some human programming or, or interference or input um, to follow a set of coded uh, parameters. Um, and this kind of also lends back to the question, there, there's two schools of thought um, out there right now, and I'm going to address those right now. One, um, in the public or the public size, they overestimate what airplanes are capable of, of doing. So they think that, you know, the airplanes that we fly, Airbus A320 or 737, they're fully autonomous. Pilots get in there, we push one button, airplane is like a robot droid overlord and just takes over, does everything, lands at the destination. I was just along for the ride. And then there's others that underestimate um, what, uh, you know, this automation level can do. And they have no idea. There's people today that have absolutely no idea that an airplane is capable of landing itself in, in some, some cases. And I think this has trickled down to pilots where there's now sometimes this stigma attached where pilots feel like they're almost lesser pilots for using automation or relying on it. And Airbus versus Boeing, there are some Boeing pilots that feel like as an Airbus pilot, I'm not a real pilot. And, and that's, that's the furthest thing from the truth. So before we move further in the conversation, let's talk about some of the pros um, in terms of automation and what it brings to the table. Um, for one, I would say it reduces pilot workload. We talked about some of these systems before, takeoff performance, uh, fuel management, uh, station keeping, um, uh, even landing performance, so on and so forth. So many different flight augmentation systems. A lot of these things were manual processes before. To turn an airplane before, can you imagine if I had to make my own flight plan, I had to calculate um, all you know, my different fuel burn, my headings and tracks and altitudes and um, speeds and power settings, it, it would be almost impossible. So based on the demands that are given on cruise these days, you know, I fly from Toronto to Kingston, Jamaica, honestly, pray for me that I do that again soon. Um, but you fly from Toronto, Kingston, Jamaica, you know, have a plane full of passengers and cargo, turn that airplane around in, a, in an hour and I'm back to Toronto within an hour after touching down, I'm on my way back to Toronto. So the automation in terms of reducing pilot workload is key, especially for what is demanded of us. Uh, increases situational awareness. So uh, this is absolutely key. When you're in an airplane and you're on the controls, you're on the stick, you're on the throttle, you're going through weather, you're focusing on flying an ILS, maintaining power setting, make sure you're not overspeeding anything. That takes a lot of brain cells. And you'll see later on, I'm gonna show a video on uh, selective attention. You can see what happens to our brains when we start focusing on one particular thing. You're gonna miss a lot of different things that are going on. So in terms of being able to as pilots, especially if you're at the airline level, you've already proven that you know how to fly an airplane. You have all the licensing, you have all the ratings. Now 
your focus is on the bigger picture. Um, you'll also note at like places like Air Canada, when they're doing their command upgrades, they don't even care if they see the captain flying. In emergency situations, they actually prefer if the captain delegates the flying to the FO or if the automatics are working that they use the autopilot because that's where you're gonna be able to sit back, take a look and take stance of the bigger picture in terms of what's going on around you and make good, solid uh, decisions. So as a commander, if your FO is there in this emergency situation, you wanna take a, you know actual control of the situation, sometimes the best is to relinquish that control to the, the machine or to the other pilot. Um, increases passenger comfort. Well, I, I would like to think that my flying is the most comfortable for passengers, but it's not. The plane is gonna do a better job of flying than I, than I can, especially if it's straight and level. Um, it, it, it has the ability to just do that with such finesse. I don't know if any of you have ever been flying and you're on approach and you feel the inputs start to change a little bit, becomes a little bit more aggressive. I don't know. Maybe it's because the pilot took the autopilot off and is now flying. So absolutely increasing passenger comfort is, is key. Um, we talked about landing minima, decreasing landing minima. Um, having the automatics do the job has allowed things like uh, category three at Air Canada, category two and category threes are automatic landings. Um, you can land manually on a category two, but a category three is an automatic landing. And that's because of the lower minima and without automation, uh, that wouldn't be uh, possible. Um, from my Airbus presentation, we saw centralized aircraft uh, diagnostics with the ECAM. Um, so electronic uh, centralized aircraft monitoring. Uh, before, in the olden days, you had to take a look at your oil pressure, oil temperature, all of these different gauges to determine uh, what's, what's wrong with the airplane. Whereas now, the airplane will tell you, oh, you, you have an oil leak or whatever. Yes, you still have to do secondary diagnostics, but the airplane gives you an idea of what's wrong. And that's all possible. And that's all part of the pros of the um, automation uh, process. It's not all good, though. <laughs> Um, what are some of the cons? Uh, Over-reliance, for sure, and complacency. The machine's doing the job, and the machine does the job sometimes so well that sometimes you forget that the machine is doing the job or you don't tell the machine to do what it's supposed to do. So uh, over-reliance over and complacency is a big deal. We'll look at a couple accidents and, and whatnot uh, later on in the presentation. You'll see that that is a real problem. Um, Degrade. Degradation of skills, that's huge. Um, you know, the airplane does so much of the flying now that, you know, your basic flying skills, if you're not careful, they can, they can go away fast. And it is a very perishable skill, especially when you're dealing with that much power in, uh, in a big, large transport category aircraft. Uh, bad inputs can be catastrophic. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the accident uh, with American Airlines 757 going into Cali, Colombia. Uh, the automation, they put in the wrong uh, waypoint. They thought that they're going to a waypoint they were cleared to, but the airplane turned the wrong direction. They weren't paying attention. Bad input, garbage in, what a, garbage out. What about the MCAS? That's also a bad input. Oh, absolutely. And we'll talk about that. So I won't steal the thunder off of that too much. But yeah, so yeah, bad input. Um, can be catastrophic. So we, we, need, to, we need to also be vigil, vil, uh, vigilant um, with regard to that. Um, um, Jafaz, you asked this question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, was, was just going to add that um, we, ha we have examples outside of aviation as well, where, mm -hmm. where um, automation or things being semi-autonomous, uh, those have led to car accidents uh, with, with persons who drive Tesla. Uh, yeah. because, because the car is quote unquote, it, it, it's supposed to drive itself. People uh, kind of don't look at the fact that it's semi-autonomous and not fully autonomous. So they, they don't realize that they still have to be paying attention to, to the car and monitoring it and what it's doing. So that has led to a, a couple of accidents as well. Just to give, a, give an example of something not aviation related that has to do with automation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I bring up the Tesla example a little bit later on, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, 
and that's one of the dangers of of you know this autonomous world uh, that we're entering where um, in aviation for the most part you hope at least that you're dealing with uh, professionals and they understand the machine and the limitations but you introduce this to someone you know who's just you know and, and the thing is in aviation too you're supposed to know the systems and know it inside out and know you know, when you can use it, when you can't use it. We have very strict limitations. Like I talk about category three, we know when, when we can't use it. Um, but now you introduce uh, autonomous driving in cars and people are like, okay, hey, I'm gonna take a nap or I'm gonna put my makeup on. And they're not paying attention because they think that the machine can do it on its own. And we're just not, not there yet. Um, that's, that's why I was always thinking they should have introduced autonomous driving to trucks before cars because those people can, are trained drivers instead of just the average driver because I've seen many people get in accidents on Teslas. Absolutely, right? And that's the thing. It's, it's different when as a, as, a, as a professional driver where this is your job and you have a license uh, that you hold. I mean, everyone's licensed on the road to drive, but I wonder you if can buy a license. Buy it. Yeah, <laughs> I, th I wonder if people buy their license because literally they just don't have any care for any of the rules of the road. And now you add another layer of complexity to this autonomous driving. Yeah, I, I agree with that statement. Like, yeah. But you can't, with yes. Trucks. Because for trucks, it's very hard to get a commercial driver license and it, not anybody can just get it. You have to train. So I feel like if they get the autonomous driving, they're the people who need it the most. You don't need an autonomous car to go down to the store to buy Island Grill. But if it's your job and you're on the highway every day, I think that will help out a little bit more. Yeah, I think, I think if, if it can get to a point, and it will, um, where safety um, can be improved and we can reduce the amount of accidents on the road by having autonomous driving, I think it's a win. Um, it gets but, to a point that's good enough that should just take out the steering wheel and the pedals and just make it drive itself. No control yeah. from the people. So, right. but, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Andrew. He's asking, was it really a bad input entirely or an input that's needed but wasn't done correctly? For the Cali Columbia crash with American Airlines? Um, he didn't specify what exactly. Well, okay, so if it was with the Cali Columbia crash, it was literally a bad input. So the airplane was literally not on the course that it was supposed to be on. But also, it was also on um, Cali, also had their navigation equipment down, or so I heard, because of some uprising. Yeah, but that, I mean, even if the navigation equipment is down, if you're totally not where you're expecting to be and there's terrain in between you and where you need to go, that's, that's not good. I, I mean, at True. the end of the day, it's not, it's not, and we'll talk about it, <laughs> makes me realize there's so much more to this presentation, but um, it's never just one thing that brings down an airplane, right? It's, it's a series of things, right? So yes, you're right. Um, that was a contributing factor that some of their navigation equipment was down, but also the airplane wasn't where it was supposed to be. So there was terrain in the way as well. And then their uh, form of automation tried to help them, but when it tried to help them, they had their speed brakes extended and the Boeing system didn't auto retract the speed brakes when they put the thrust up. So they said if the thrust, if the speed brakes had been retracted, maybe they could have made the climb out. So there's other factors that are associated, but one of the major issues there was that they went, um, they were completely off their charted course. And if they had stopped, if they had stopped that part, if they had prevented that part from continuing on, then some of the follow on wouldn't have happened. Uh, cool. Makes sense? Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, so the other thing that um, with automation is it can, can complicate simple tasks. Um, runway change. I don't know if there's anyone in here that flies a transport category aircraft that can attest to this. You're at a busy airport and they give you a runway change. That is a long list of steps that now you have to go through in order to do something that is not very complicated. But with automation, it complicates it. Um, and the last one, um, which you'll see in some of these accents is that the automation, because it's based on so many uh, inputs and sensors and technology, it fails and it can fail at the most inopportune times because, you know, if you're in bad weather and your sensors are failing, you, that's when you want the automation to work. But the sensors start failing, it's going to say, hey, I can't handle this. I don't know what's happening anymore. Over to you. So 
that's something to consider as well when we're talking about uh, an automated world. So automation design, I don't know, has anyone seen this graph before? That's a quadratic equation. It is. <laughs> Um, it's a parabola. <laughs> has any has do you, have you seen it in this respect before? Yerkes Dodson. Anyone study human factors in here? All right. So I'll explain it really quick. So this is part of the issue. So we realize that, and I'll kind of hint to it, or at least my conclusion is that based on where we are with uh, technology at a state, there there still needs to be a human element. And because there still needs to be a human element, automation designers face a huge dilemma. And the technology exists for the computers to do so much more, but they can't really push that limit because we're that limiting factor because humans are bad at two things. The graph shows this right uh, well. There's an optimal stress level. So if we're not stressed enough, things are going too easy. Our performance is way down, as you can see here. Our performance is way down. Optimal stress, we're nice, we're good right here. Too much stress, things are going really bad, we go way back down low. So the key is trying to design automation equipment that keeps us at this cool. level. Um, the other thing is that, yes, we can design the computer and the machine to do most of the work, but if something goes wrong and or if we need to find information, if the computer is bombarding us with information, a lot of information gets missed. So now how the, the, the question is, how do you design equipment that's able to meet this optimal balance? And I know everyone thinks they're better than anyone else. And you see some of these accidents and things go wrong and you're like, hey, you know what? That wouldn't happen to me, but I'm going to play a video for you right now and be honest once we finish this video with yourself and see how many people fall trapped to some of the the tricks that are in in this video anyway I'm, i've even told you to expect something is going to happen and i bet the majority of people are still going to have something go on but you be your own judge today we're going to play a game specifically designed to test your spatial awareness Meet the Brain Games Double Dutch Team. Now, what does jumping rope have to do with the brain? Well, Double Dutch requires off-the-chart spatial awareness. And today, these kids are going to help us test yours. For this game, all you have to do is keep track of the number of times that either of the girls in green jumps. You'll count each time one of them lands a jump, like this. One, two, three, four, five. As you can see, these jumpers are pretty quick on their feet, so you're going to have to pay attention to keep up. When the whistle blows, start counting. Ready? Go. So, how many jumps did the green team make? Did you say 38? If so, you agreed with 40% of our test audience. <laughs> now, some of you may be on to us, but for those of you who aren't, did you happen to notice anything else going on during the double dutch? Maybe a giant chicken strolling right through the middle of the set and doing a funky chicken dance? Now, some of you may have missed that funky chicken, but many of you probably saw it, and that's okay because the chicken was just there to distract you too. Here's the real question. What color was the wall behind the double dutch game? Here's a hint. It wasn't the same color at the end as it was when they started jumping. The back wall was changing color the entire time, from bright blue to bright red. Nearly everyone misses it, but why? It turns out there's far too much information coming in through the eyes at any given moment for the brain to fully process all of it. As a result, the brain has to act like a spotlight, focusing our attention on some parts of the scene, but not others. Now, 
Most of you were probably paying attention to the jumpers. And some of you may have suspected that something strange was going to happen, and so you saw the chicken. <laughs> but you probably weren't paying attention to the back wall. And what we don't pay attention to, we don't see. And uh, hey, for those of you who managed to catch everything so far, did you notice that we also swapped the rope turners out halfway through? Gotcha. So who was superhuman and caught all of those things? I looked away for one. I didn't see that. I didn't see that the uh, um, rope, whatever you want to call it. So. Yeah, that last part, I totally did not catch that. I did not yeah. see that. Because you know what? The thing is, too, like, there's variations of this uh, experiment where, because the first time I saw it was with a gorilla. I don't know if anyone saw that one, um, where they're doing something similar and a gorilla kind of danced across the room. So I was su suspecting something like that. So I saw the chicken, but I didn't see the colors changing and I didn't see them um, switch the rope turners, which it just shows you when you're expecting it, you'll see it. When you're not expecting, you're being bombarded with so much information, it's really, really hard to process everything. So because we've we kind of, we've, we're, I'm hinting to a future in automation that includes pilots, it's a dilemma design for uh, these aircraft designers. How do you make an airplane that has enough interaction for us to be stimulated at our optimum stress level where performance is, is there, but also how do you, how do you pre present enough information that we get the right information at the right time and we're not bombarded and start missing pieces of information. So it's a key element. And as we can see, when you have layers and layers of this involved, there's sometimes you lead to some, some of these accidents. We're gonna talk about, uh, briefly talk about um, uh, a few of the famous ones um, that happened and uh, and then we'll move on to the next aspect of uh, of the presentation before we make make some conclusions here Is so does there... anyone sorry go ahead go ahead you go ahead sorry um, anyone know what happened with this one Air France 296 oh yeah, oh, yeah. Um, the pilot you go Ver. you go uh, the pilot okay he tried to keep the thrust level low while pitching upward and he tried to lift it but it was yeah, it turns out it didn't, like, the automated, the automated system didn't perk itself properly or in time, and it, I don't know, something like that. It went to the trees and crashed. Yeah, I think he was doing an air show, and he was trying to get as slow as he could, mm -hmm. but the system wouldn't let him do it. Ah, so I, I think he hit alpha floor, and then, mm -hmm. or something like that. So the plane wanted him to move, but I think he still wanted to stay down low so that people could see him, and I think he fought the plane, to the point where I did something and ended up him falling into the trees because he was doing the exact opposite of what the plane wanted him to do. Okay, so see, I, I like I like this discussion because immediately people blame the automation in this respect. And yeah, we can blame the automation, but we can also blame the pilot and we can blame both. But um, it didn't happen based on one or the other. It's, it's how these two uh, people or two systems work together. Um, so in any accident, as I hinted to early in the presentation, there's a number of factors. And in this one, uh, is no exception. So there was late stabilization. In a jet, late stabilization is very, very bad. Because now if you are late stabilizing, you're forced now. So say stabilization, we always refer to configuration and speed. So now if you're late stabilizing, your thrust is to be all the way back. So, uh, jet engines at idle low level equals bad, unless you're trying to touch down. Late stabilization is very bad. So the, that's one. So the power was at idle longer than expected. And so naturally they're gonna take longer to spool up. They had planned this um, fly past. Uh, someone has a uh, volume in their background. I don't know if you wouldn't mind muting. Whoa, whoa. Um, so there's also trees at the, uh, at the end of the runway, but the thing is that runway, uh, wasn't the planned runway when they were coming in to set up, they had planned the longer runway with a clear obstacle path. And then late in the game, which led to their late stabilization, they noticed that there were trees, 40 foot trees at the end. So now being distracted, trying to line up for a different runway they planned not to go lower than 100 feet and they ended up sinking inadvertently below 100 feet. 
So now you have late stabilization, obstacles at the end, being lower than the expected. Now you add in the Airbus element where Airbus is always going to try and protect uh, itself. Um, it's not a robot, but it has automated systems that are designed to protect AOA. So being slow with the auto throttles off, the pilot's trying to pull back on the stick. There's no power that's introduced yet. The plane's like, no, 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 no. I need to protect my alpha here. This is a really high angle of attack and I need to protect my angle of attack. So as he's commanding backwards pressure on the stick, the plane's like, no, 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 no. That's gonna stall me. So it's pushing the nose of the airplane down. So with the long spool time, the airplane counteracting his movements and so on and so forth, it was, it was too late by the time he reacted. So you see, it's not one thing. It's a culmination of how the human is interacting uh, with the automation. Here's another one. Air I France, have a question about that. Why yeah, didn't they yeah, just go. force the plane into alternate law or direct law to do this so they didn't have to fight anything? It wouldn't have to be an alternate law um, in order to... Uh, for them to, to be able to overturn it. The simple solution to that would be um, for them just to have not had obstacles at the end, not be below 100 feet. They, there was a, a lot of mitigation that should have been done uh, earlier on, like well before, like in the planning stages of things. Um, they should have yeah. known what runway they were supposed to be lined up on. They shouldn't at any point in time been lower or so close to obstacles um, because even if you put that in a non uh, fly-by-wire type aircraft, the, based on how late they spooled, they would have still probably clipped the trees, right? Or stalled the aircraft and then crashed into the ground. You know what I mean? Because that maneuver that they did, essentially in our books is called a low energy go around. And for us, a low energy go around is firewall. So toga thrust. We have to decrease the attitude of the aircraft to uh, at least a touchdown uh, attitude. We have to accelerate the aircraft past uh, the minimum approach speed. And then once we have all those parameters met, then we can start to climb. Because if you start to pull a nose back in a, a critical wing like a jet, uh, like a swept back wing like the Airbus uh, A320 has, you're going to stall before the engines start doing anything. So even without the automatics, that would have still been somewhat catastrophic. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. And for your go around, all of that is done by the SRS, isn't it? So SRS is a speed reference system, but the SRS will command a certain pitch for based on the power that's, that's set, right? But if you're, if you're commanding that pitch, but you don't have the power in, you're gonna stall. And so when we do a low energy go around, it's designed to be done like where you expect the wheels are going to touch down. The energy is so low uh, on the airplane that, that the wheels could potentially uh, shut down because you cannot follow the speed reference system on the Airbus until you're above a minimum speed because it's going to try and protect. It's going to try and protect itself. So it's going to want to pitch to maintain uh, so it doesn't lose the, the lift on, on the wing. Whereas if you're doing this in a conventional aircraft, it probably won't do that to protect itself, but you're gonna be mushing through it. You'd probably end up in a secondary stall anyway. Does that make sense? It's a secondary stall. So now you're, you have power on, you're not, uh, the, the aircraft wing is not flying. So you haven't jet regenerated lift over the wings. And then now you're inducing a power on stall as the power tries to come in and the airplane is stalling instead of you breaking it by putting the nose down. I see. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay, so we have Air France 447. Um, I'm not picking on Air France, I promise. Um, does anyone know what happened in this situation? I think it was dual input. One person thought they were overspeeding and one person thought they were stalling. They were doing the opposite. Yeah, that's part of it. Oh, Andrew Connison said in chat, uh, incorrect airspeed reading from ice crystals on the pitot tube causing the autopilot to disconnect. Okay, that's another part of it. So um, based on that, again, we're, we're leaning towards the side of the airplane was at fault, you think? Or the automatics led to this with, with a combination of some pilot error? I think it's pilot error. I mean... 
steal input they weren't communicating so that's the problem no they weren't they weren't communicating and there's no tactile feedback on the control column with uh or the side stick with the airbus it's not back driven so um you know you fly a cessna 172 whatever the guy on the right does the guy on the left feels in the airbus you can move that stick all around all day the guy in the other seat's not going to know other than when you hear dual input you know that it, that know, plane it, never had that system right it never said dual input oh it does it all the airbus have the dual input so how come on. nothing happened there it did it said it said dual input I, on the on the uh on the tapes you can hear it saying dual input but so there was so much going on as well i i don't think it was a dual input that was the issue um so let's back it up a little bit so with this it started again and and you'll see i have a diagram where i'm going to just kind of show how these accidents progress but i wonder why the pilots didn't pitch down yeah exactly why didn't they pitch down right you get so exactly. this, is, this is this is the thing though when you get into a situation like this uh, where now you're this is the this the stage that's the accident's imminent and it's going to happen there's so many bad things that have already happened before you're even here right so that's the thing it's like they've put themselves in a corner um at this point right, right? whereas right. If, 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 if there was just some mitigating things that were done in the beginning, we wouldn't even get here. And that's, and I'll show a diagram as well um, for that is that that's when we're as aviators, and, and this is what I want to encourage for this group, for any of the other aviation groups that we're a part of is being a pilot is not just about flying the aircraft. That is a very small part of what we do. You learn how to fly, you get your life. It's yes, it is a small part of what we do. Our, the biggest part of our job is is not even with our hands and feet. It's with our brains. CRM, decision-making, and mitigating situations. As a pilot, you are a problem solver. And, and, and people need to understand that. Once you understand that, you will be a better aviator. People think, I don't care. If someone impresses me and they, they, they're flying an airplane and they, they fly an ILS, perfect on the ILS, and, and perfect thrust setting, and then they do a smooth, nice touchdown and they land somewhere, but they land in horrible weather when they should have went to an alternate. Do I think that person is a good pilot because they can control the airplane? No, I think that they're a horrible pilot because they landed in weather that they should have diverted for. You know what I mean? So being a pilot, yes, you need to know how to fly an airplane, but the biggest part of what we do is, is, is in our head. And that's what's keeping us in the airplane because the automatics, can fly the airplane okay so if you want to keep it if you want to keep a job as a pilot you have to understand that the the airline is paying you for your decision making for your crew resource management for your customer service for all of those things above all right you're being paid less for the fact that you can butter the landing but more of the fact that you can communicate what you're doing and actually make the right decision in the interest of the airline and safety exactly exactly you mean so customer service sorry someone said customer service yeah customer service i mean customer you, service how do pilots help in customer service well it depends it depends on how you're how you're caging that question right i don't want to get too deep into question? that yeah go ahead Quiet. all right <clears throat> Um, pilots basically helping customer service because they are the end-to-end -end, um, managers. So when they, when you board an aircraft, from the decision the pilot takes from the point then to when the aircraft reaches its destination, he's solely responsible for how you feel about the airline. So if the customer is happy because the pilot flies smooth, went through all the good weather, landed safely, and got him there on time, then you're a happy customer. You return. What if the pilot turbulence bump you up, landed like you don't care, got you there late, then you wouldn't be a satisfied customer. Right. So that's absolute, that's, <laughs> Can that's you imagine absolute. being at cruise? Think, think, about, think about the pilot as a very high paid, glorified taxi driver. You don't want to yes. catch no taxi that's Take the high paid <laughs> part out of it. <laughs> well, but you understand the, the aspect of yeah. customers, right? 
Can you imagine yeah. being at cruise and then you're, you're eating your food and then the plane drops forward and they said the captain comes out and yo, everybody, I'm sorry, I was um putting my feet, I was kicking back my feet and accidentally hit the yoke. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more than you think. And, and we actually, at Air Canada, we had something called Focus In and I know this is a little bit of a um, uh, kind of sidebar here. I'll get back on track. But um, we had a consultants come in from, and we did a Focus In course and they said they did studies that show when pilots communicate along the way with passengers, when pilots interact with the passengers and whatnot, those people were more likely to come back and fly with that airline than when pilots didn't. So it's pilots need to understand that they play a bigger role in this than they think. It's, it's, it's a lot bigger than we have in our heads. And it's a very, very big part um, of the job because you can make or break an airline based on how your pilots act um so there's something to keep in mind so if we if we go uh further back with this air france incident yes there were a few critical errors that were made later on in the game but it goes even further back where the captain um if you listen to the tapes made a poor decision to take a break um to take his rest break just as things were starting to get really really busy he was dealing with he had his crew consisted of himself a more experienced uh, first officer and a very inexperienced uh, first officer. So for him to leave those two on the flight deck, just as they were entering the intertropical convergence zone, if you don't know what that is, it's just um, the bars um, of convergence uh, in the middle portion of the equator there around the tropics. It's known for a lot of thunderstorms. So just as they were entering in that area, they were dodging a lot of thunderstorms. It was the middle of the night. Um, they were going through a lot and he's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take my break, leave the two young guns to it. Right. So then from that poor decision, then they entered some very bad weather, a lot of turbulence. Then they were dealing with some, some really severe, uh, super cooling that actually froze the pedo tubes and these pedo tubes, there was an airworthiness directive that was out for them to be replaced. And I don't think Air France made it a priority to get them replaced. They're now all new ones, but they were susceptible in these environments that they were flying in to freeze over. So you have all of that happening. So if the pilot had, captain had stayed uh, up in the flight deck, you can argue that maybe they wouldn't have got themselves into this situation. Now, uh, wait, you're telling me the mo it's that the most, the, the two most inexperienced pilots were left in the cockpit during this storm? It, exactly yes right right and then and then and then now so now that the pedo tubes freeze over they lose speed information right they lose a whole bunch right. of information what did i say about automation in the beginning it fails at inopportune times if the pilots if the sorry if the computers aren't getting the information that they need guess what they're going to say they're going to say all right sorry i'm done it's over to you pilots do it we have it in our books um, it's called an unreliable airspeed drill. You know what the reaction to what they they should have done in the situation? And I can easily say Nothing. this because I'm I'm, I'm at airspeed I'm at airspeed zero right now, but literally at altitude they should have kept the power where it was, shouldn't have touched it, check the attitude indicator, ensure that the nose was above five degrees, and do absolutely nothing. That was it. But the first officer. Um, pulled all the way uh, back or something like Pulled that. all the way back on the stick because he's reverting to what I was talking about where he thought he was overspeeding the airplane. So he's now pulling back to get alpha floor to get out of the overspeed uh, situation and to allow the airplane to climb, not seeing that he's putting the airplane in a deep stall at altitude, right? And then because of the Airbus design as well, where the other pilot couldn't feel that happening, he didn't realize he had the stick all the way back until the end. And so then the dual input that you're talking about came later on when he was trying to control and get the nose back down. But by and the what, time- they What input did it accept? Did it accept the left or the right input? It, it, remember when we had the Airbus presentation, I talked about it, it adds them up. It adds up the inputs. So if one's pushing back and the other's pushing forward, if he's all the way back and- It does nothing. Forward, it's, it's neutral, right? So it's, it's not going to do anything. So until someone takes full uh, acceptance of control and they're both not touching the stick, they're fighting each other and accomplishing nothing. And when the captain, after he came back from his break, because he realized something was wrong, 
when he realized and got there and he's like the the inexperienced first officer said i have the stick all the way back and i've had it back the whole time he's like no 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 don't do that and then they started to recover but they at that point in time they they just didn't have the altitude anymore so in a way they were both doing whatever they felt was right they never communicated it and they never communicated but as as you can see though the decision making from the beginning not necessarily the automatic systems led to this because i mean in a situation like this the airplane even without the speed information or everything just an airplane is an airplane is an airplane is an airplane like that's what people at the end of the day as pilots too we need to realize you take out all the automatics it's still an airplane what do you do you don't do anything the airplane is still in the same attitude that you left it in it's still in the same power setting that you left it in it's going to stay where you left it don't touch anything but you know, <laughs> they tried to fix it. So this accident was pivotal in defining new training standards to address the needs of flying modern, complex, and highly automated aircraft. Because it's, it's not as simply as you turn the autopilot on. There's still that decision-making uh, element that needs to, you need to go through and you have to understand how to live and work with the automation. And I've picked on, I've picked on uh, Airbus uh, a bit. So now let's switch gears over to Boeing. Um, and let's talk about this Asiana 214. Does anyone remember what happened here? They go off the runway, like on an auto land or something? Hold on. No, just... that's, not, that's, not, that's not that one. All right, before I move on, so technically the pilots said they were pitching back and then pitch forward. They were just, there was difference in the control. One was moving back, one was moving forward. Uh, they, they were. They had a dual input. Um, the yeah. extent of what their dual inputs were is almost irrelevant. But the fact that the uh, inexperienced first officer was pulling back on the stick um, at that altitude um, and putting the airplane into a deep stall and they didn't arrest or try to recover from that stall high up, and high up enough, that was the, the end result that ended, in, ended up in them uh, impacting uh, the ocean. Oh, got it. Okay, cool. Um, does anyone remember Asiana 214? How is the top broken off? From fire. Hey, I went away for a second. What is that happening here? What, what caused this accident? I, I haven't. I'm, I'm asking what uh, caused this accident. Oh. Yeah, we haven't started talking about this one yet. I was asking if anyone knows what happened with Does this Andrew thing. know? Andrew Connors and Brian knows. Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll let you guys know. So, low approach and speed. Say again? Someone said it. Andrew, Andrew said low approach and speed. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, ultimately it was a uh, uh, low approach and uh, low airspeed that led to this. But, again, this is a situation here where um, you know, it, it's this disconnect uh, in terms of crew resource management and automation that caused this crash because you have a perfectly functioning airplane uh, on a visual approach in, in awesome you know, conditions. Look at the wind socket. There's barely any wind. And you have this airplane that crashes just shy of the breakwater uh, prior to the threshold of runway 2A left. So like any accident, as we'll see, there are a myriad of issues. Um, but what had happened was there was an uncommanded or inadvertent selection of fletch. Uh, that's a Boeing term. It stands for a flight level change. So the airplane power came up unexpectedly uh, on a, in a jet. Um, when you're that close to the ground on profile, you, that's the last thing you want is the power to come up above, you know, the threshold when you're on. Uh, profile because now you're going to be above profile and it's really hard to restabilize. So seeing this happen, the pilot panics, disconnects the autopilot, disconnects the auto thrust, puts the thrust all the way at idle. We, this is probably starting to sound familiar to some people. And then amidst all that correction, there was confusion as to whether the auto throttles were engaged. Power is at idle in a jet low to the ground. Like I mentioned in the Airbus A320, this is a Boeing um same thing you don't want idle especially when you have big engines like on the 777 and uh, they, they thought the auto thrust was on and that it was going to bring the power back up it didn't they got slow they 
commanded the go around thrust. Um, but at that point, it was too late. I think they commanded go around thrust 1.5 seconds before impact. At that point, it's too late. I think it takes up to seven seconds for these engines to spool up. So as you see here, not one thing. Yes, them interacting, not well, how seven interact seconds. Uh, approximately up to seven for, seconds for, for engines to spool up. Yeah, approximately. That's why I really? like. Uh, that's why I like piston-driven internal combustion. Uh, uh, approximately, yeah. Um, uh, if you check the Boeing, I, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Could I engage the person who asked seven seconds? Yeah, I'm here. What's your name, sir? Uh, Matthew Summers. Matthew Summers, okay. And you said you are currently training in Florida, right? Yeah, I'm in Florida, yeah. All right. Cool. Continuing. No, I'm just trying to figure out who I'm speaking to before I answer the question. Um, with turbine engines or turbo fans or turbo prop, um, yeah. Unlike the internal combustion engine, they right. have to they have to draw the air in by the compressors. Right. So when you when you basically put in the power that you require, the computers right. then tell the fuel system to increase fuel, but the fuel right. system will read the air and say there's not enough air in the engine, so it adds that fuel um, in increments until the engine can spool up to full power. So basically, you do not want to add more fuel than right. the engine could consume, because then you'll have a, a die out, a rich die out. Oh. When he, when he, Chris, can I ask a question too? When yeah. he said it's because the engine is bigger, because the engine is bigger, and I guess it has larger turbine blades. Does like the moment of inertia have anything to play as well? No, e even the small turbine engines, they all take a time because, unlike a piston engine, when you when you push that throttle in, it automatically opens the valve that allows air to go into the engine. And because that valve is open, you get an almost instant reaction. But with a turbine engine, there is no big valve controlling the airflow. It's the speed of oh. the turbines that control the flow. So you need that speed to spool up. So right. you can't fuel in a heartbeat. It needs the time. So that is the disadvantage between um, turbine and piston. I see. Oh, so that, oh that's cool. why they, they wouldn't use it in a car because you need instant power and things like that, right? Yeah. So, it burns, so, plus it burns a lot of fuel. <laughs> yeah. So when you say seven seconds, that's the time from idle to full power. Oh. Yeah. So um, in, that, in, in that time, it's like giving you, it's like progressively getting more and more power though? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you guys were here for my uh, Airbus. I know Jafaz was, but Matthew, I don't know if you were, but... We talked about stabilizing the engines. So when when we stand up the throttles, we have to bring them up to 50% before we can advance them for takeoff. Um, when we're advancing the thrust levers on takeoff in an Airbus A320, and you take you hear the power taking its sweet time to get up to that halfway mark before we add full power or before we had our takeoff thrust, that is not a function of us moving the thrust levers slowly the thrust levers are where they need to be it, it, the, the time that it takes is the engine that's how long the engines are taking to spool up so there's the power is set but this the spool time is based on the engine spooling up on their own and if that adds some perspective to how long the jet engines take uh, to get up if they're at 50 percent though the time from 50 percent to full power is, is is a lot smaller than the time from zero to 50 percent so that's why it's important on jet engines that you have some form of spool on them so that if you need that power that it's it's there a lot quicker it's faster from 50 to 100 than zero to 100 to 50. it's it's faster from 50 to 100 than it is from zero to 50 if that makes sense is it because of the moment of inertia or no? um chris what would you say that uh, it's, it's during just startup during startup the engine has to take a lot of energy to get it going so it takes 12 seconds just to get the start at the right speed with airflow going through the engine before you can induce fuel. And then once you induce fuel, the engine has to protect itself. So what the engine will do, it will shed fuel um, based on three parameters. The amount of airflow going through the engine, the speed of the engine, and the ITT. Um, most times we don't take the ITT, which is the inter-turbine temperature into consideration. But the engine does. If there's not enough airflow to cool the engine, it will not add more fuel. 
Um, Damar and the people who've been acquainted with turbine engine will understand that the temperatures in these jet engines will range between 500 degrees Celsius to about 1500 degrees Celsius. And the operating temperature is about 680 degrees Celsius. So in order not to burn your engines, it needs that time for airflow to come in and cool it during starting. So the engine needs to um, protect itself. And it oh. just... Yeah, I mean, on, on, at idle, we're like 300 degrees, um, on normal idle, 300 degrees Celsius. So it just gives you and a perspective. If you got a tailwind, if wind is going up through the exhaust of a turbine engine, um, Damar would tell you, you probably noticed the ITT was higher during start. Yeah, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it can even affect the start. Um, and it, because it, for the airbuses, they will shut the engine down automatically. Like yeah. So then you got that's, that's, that's critical. How for do the you six, start it then? Not in a tailwind. <laughs> Have them push you so that you're in a headwind. That's an issue sometimes on the six seven as well. Um, yeah. Where with the APU, uh, APU uh, doesn't like tailwind at all. So you know, if you're starting one of the engines. Um, it's important that you don't have too strong of a tailwind because as the APU is getting uh, the air commanded from the, the engine um, with, the, with the tailwind, it can cut out. So anyway, um, any questions on this one before we continue? Can anybody die? Okay. All right. Last one I we want to talk about. Did anybody die in that crash? Uh, yeah, um, okay. I believe there was one fatality, but not from the crash. I think it was from the fire trucks that ran Seriously? over. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it was from the. I think one person, one person died. Cor someone correct me on that. I yeah, one person. Look up the, died. the aircraft, the um, fire truck ran over her. Yeah, the ref fire truck ran over. Wait, her. what? The person survived the crash and they got run over by a fire truck. Yes, yeah, because yeah. she was running. Um, she just was running from the aircraft. She wasn't running like, oh, I'm getting away from this um, thing. She didn't take any uh, martial advice from the people trying to direct her. So the fire truck in responding, um, just she ended up crossing the path of the fire truck. Um, they blame the fire truck. But um, how I see it is that um, no one is at fault. Um, she was getting away and they were getting too. Yeah. She wasn't Crazy. concentrating on them, nor were they concentrating on her. So exactly, it's just unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. So so no. the, for for this one um, here, sorry, I'm just trying to keep uh, us moving. I don't want to run a, too far over the time, um, but uh, Lion Air six ten and EPO, Ethiopian uh, three hundred two, uh, pretty self explanatory here. Um, I think these are the most talked about uh, accidents in recent history. Um, so I, I know I don't have to really ask, but uh, the airplane has been since grounded since e Ethiopian uh, 302 and is in the process of recertification right now. But uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, there was an article uh, written by William uh, Lanjawishi and he was saying that he put, he put, it's a scathing article uh, as well, and he put a lot of the blame on uh, pilots and saying Boeing designed a system that wasn't bad um, and uh, the pilots were just not good enough to do the right actions to overcome it. Um, but a lot of other people realize, just like any other accident, um, there's a series of issues here. You have an unknown system, MCAS, maneuvering characteristics augmentation system that uh, went rogue, uh, had faulty information and was trying to rectify something that wasn't an issue. And just like I said, automation tends to fail at inopportune times. Um, it was introduced uh, because the MAX here is a, a very late iteration of a 737 that's heavily been heavily modified over the years. The engine's far bigger than what it was originally designed for and it was designed to you know act quietly in the background and give pilots the same feel as previous generation 737s um, but and the pilots didn't know about it but in this case when it had faulty information and the autopilot was off and the flaps were up it thought there was a high OA and it just kept trying to command the nose down um, were the pilots actions correct in in these 
maybe not, but if you think you're getting all this conflicting information, how, how would you deal with it? And most pilots acknowledge that they would have probably uh, done what these pilots had, had done in the situation. So um, I've been hinting to this all along. And as you can see with uh, uh, automation accidents, the, the big question is who is to blame? The pilots, the automation, or both? And you see here from this diagram, and this is a famous uh, re, uh, James uh, Reason model called the Swiss cheese model. And it shows that these pieces of cheese are different uh, policies, procedures, and uh, training all, all put in place. And when an error happens, you know, automation policies are supposed to stop that. If that doesn't stop it, automation procedures are supposed to stop that. If not, then training is supposed to stop it or CRM. It says HPMA, but that's a military term. It means the same thing. Um, that's supposed to stop it. Aircraft handling skills are the last line of defense. That's supposed to stop it, but it doesn't. Um, so you can see that if you mitigate um, with these things in place, then there's a, a unlikely uh, act for an accident to occur. And this is something that's key, is that we need to be very stringent on our procedures, especially when we're dealing uh, with automated uh, aircraft. At Air Canada, this is what we use. It's called the threat and error model. Um, this is actually grilled into us. And it's as it looks and how it's designed in that we want to stay on the proactive side of things at all times. So what we do is we identify threats early on and we don't want to get down to the reactive state. If we do, I'll show on the next slide what we're supposed to do to get back up to proactive. And if we stay proactive all times, then this is how we prevent the Swiss cheese model from occurring because if we fall from proactive to reactive and then from reactive, then we have an error we're supposed to mitigate that to get right back up to being proactive because if we don't, we end up at UAS. UAS stands for undesired aircraft state. So in terms of working with automation effectively, I think there has to, we have to stress that there is a requirement for a lot more discipline in the flight deck. Uh, this is just from the previous model here. So it shows when we're reactive, we have to categorize things as Two, there's two main categories. It's no time or time. If we have no time, then there's few situations where there's no time, maybe low fuel, fire, smoke, security. We plan, communicate, we get it done. If we have time, we have all the time in the world. Take your time, breathe in, nothing has to happen fast. Create more time, plan, communicate. So these are some of the key things uh, that are involved uh, to ensuring that we live uh, well with uh, automation. So a pilotless uh, future. So I asked Jafaz this question. Sorry, man, you're, you're very popular. Um, and I'll ask the group the question. Um, seeing that there's few rogue automation examples, um, most times, as you've seen in, in the previous examples that I've shown, humans are often the weak link. So with that being said, should we be eliminated? And will automation eliminate us? We've seen the flight decks uh, dwindle down in positions. We've seen as much as five different positions on the flight deck from a flight engineer, radio operator, navigator, pilots, to now having a captain, first officer. And sometimes in some situations we have single pilots. So do you see there being a future without pilots? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, in the far, far future after yeah, I'm like gone. Yeah, far, far future, but not Yes, now. I mean. And why? Why, why, do you, why do you state that? And what, what's, what are some of your reasonings behind that argument? I would personally say in the future, way, when I say way, I mean like in 100 years or something <laughs> like that, like very long time. When we're all of us here are dead, probably. But <laughs> just way down the line, there'll come a, a point in time where you now question, is it really even worth it? And at this point, you would say the pilot is more of a liability than anything. Because mm -hmm. at that point, we would say computers have reached a point where they can outthink people, they make better decisions, and their decisions are never biased towards something. And it's always in the best interest of whatever it's coded to do. And they would say, we don't need to pay these two people or just one person to do this yeah. task when 
the computer is in uh, is of better interest. Okay, that's a good point. I'd, I'd like to add something. So, um, looking looking at the the lion here and the, the Ethiopian incidents or, or accidents, um, I would say that I, I'd agree with the guy saying that you, I don't see there being a cockpit without human beings for the foreseeable future. And um, from the MCAS situation, where with the conflicting information being given by the AOA sensors or, or whatever, um, I think that the nature is too dynamic for, um, for the computers to, to sense everything or for the computers to, to react to everything. Or uh, it's a machine and machines fail. And mm -hmm. that's why we have mechanics and that's why we have engineers and, and things like that because mm -hmm. things can go wrong. So uh, if, not, if not a pilot, then definitely a, a human being to, to monitor the systems and um, mm -hmm. do troubleshooting in case problems arise or things like that. I, I don't think that humans will be eliminated fully, but I, I don't know if a pilot per se would be necessary. I mean, if you're up there and a problem goes wrong, you definitely would need to know how to fly an airplane. But I think in the long run, it's going to be more of a, a, a systems monitoring or overseeing type of aspect as opposed to uh, fully hands-on um, like, like we are today. Okay, that's a great answer. So uh, to, for me um, to argue that, and I, I, I agree with you, I, I bring in, and we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, um, is what happened to a self-driving car future? Um, I don't know if anyone's realized, but maybe like two or three years ago, there was a big self-driving push and a big self-driving hype that's gone fairly quiet. I don't know if anyone's realized how quiet that has gone um, because there are some tech, tech companies that um, made some bold promises. I know if anyone can recall, GM promised they promised that they'd have self-driving cars by 2019. That's come and gone. Ford said 2021. Um, so uh -huh. they still have a little bit of time. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I can already tell you that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ford said 2021. Um, I don't know if you recall as well. Uh, Uber uh, was very aggressive in their self-driving program. You, I thought... Did that know, kill they, somebody? It, ah, see? Man, this guy is smart. So there was, uh, in 2018, uh, one of their test vehicles actually killed someone in Arizona. So their program has been put on hold. Um, and what the problem people have realized um, as, as they try to push this technology, it, it seems very like a simple solution at first, but then as you dig into it, you realize that artificial intelligence based on our current computing, computing sorry, when it's faced with uh, challenges that it's never seen, it struggles, like absolutely struggles to solve the problem. And someone mentioned Tesla earlier because Tesla has tried to combat this by having its self-driving cars constantly. And I mean, constantly upload information based on its real world experiences and encountered situations and whatnot so that it can constantly tweak its software. But even with that, they're realizing that when a self-driving car, based on all that programming and all that uh, you know, computing makes an ill-advised decision, um, when it does that, they realize that that is so difficult to debug because it's hard for them to pinpoint why it's programmed this way. Why did it make that decision? And then we have to ask ourselves other questions like bad weather. What does it do in bad weather? My wife has a 2017, uh, Honda Pilot, and I'll tell you this right now, when it's snowing, the, all those sensors are gone crazy because you can take your hands off the wheel and we'll steer whatever. It can't detect the lane. Um, it thinks another car is coming head on. It's telling you to brake. Uh, a whole bunch of things in bad weather. What about unpaved roads? There's a lot of unpaved roads in Jamaica. How do we deal with self-driving cars uh, uh, in, in, in that respect in other countries? in Canada, in, in, in countries in Africa that have unpaved roads, how do we deal with that? Um, unmapped roads, the roads that are not mapped, how do we deal with that? Um, and then the ultimate question is um, unanswered ethical questions like, if a self-driving car is faced with a dilemma 
where it needs to either protect itself and its passengers or protect a pedestrian, what does it choose to do and how do we program it to handle those situations? So based on all of these parameters with a self-driving car and making it so hard to prove uh, to regulators, because these things need certification that these cars are safe, how then can we apply self-driving or self-piloting uh, to airplanes? Um, one thing, any pilot, you know, especially if you're flying larger transport category uh, aircraft will, will know is that um, we have something called MEL, minimum equipment list, and we have a master minimum uh, equipment list. And I'm not sure if this has uh, been discussed in the automation realm. So how do we deal with uh, these failures? Is there gonna be any form of MEL relief? Um, in this example, you can see there's a FMGC1 uh, failure in operative. And with that one component being failed, it shows all the other information here. But now we can't do ETOPS. Uh, FMGC1 needs to be deactivated. FMS1 is considered inoperative. Uh, autopilot1 is considered inoperative. We have to apply this MEL for the autopilot. Flight Director1 is considered inoperative. Another MEL, Category 3 dual approaches are not conducted, and so on and so forth. So we now become so restricted. So how do we then, if we go fully autonomous, how do we deal with these failures? Have they been uh, a part of, of, the, of the argument. What about the worst case scenario? In aviation right now, it's our bread and butter to talk about the worst case scenario. It's embedded in our training. You know, we talk about engine failures, rejected takeoffs, the worst case scenario. How do we deal with the worst case scenario with respect to self-driving cars? So I, based on all of this, I've concluded myself that outside of a closed loop, replacing humans in general, so to go pilotless, it's, it's almost, it's near impossible. Um, on a good day, um, perfectly functioning systems and components, it's hard enough. So then how do you layer that into, uh, you know, bad worst case uh, scenarios? So I hinted to this in the beginning and I'll go back to this um, now um, as we're getting closer to the end of this presentation is um, we have to live with automation and at least for the foreseeable, um, uh, future. So we have to do it effectively. And I fly Airbus. Maybe Boeing has something uh, similar that they've come up with. But as an Airbus pilot, we have something called the golden rules. And there's four of them. And the first one will be very familiar to everyone because this is spread aviation wide. And it's done in this order. Airbus says fly, but we'll better know that as aviate, navigate, communicate. I'm sure every pilot in here has, has learned that. And in the situations that happen, if these priorities of flying the aircraft, navigating the aircraft and communicating effectively were used, a lot of these accidents wouldn't, wouldn't have happened and there would have been a much better amicable coexistence between pilot and machine. Um, use the appropriate level of automation at all times. And I'm gonna show you on a, a chart right here. Um, so this is a, called the automation uh, pyramid and there's some Boeing terminology in here, but it, it all means the same thing. At the top is fully um, automated flying. And as you see on the left-hand side, that is for decreased workload, increased SA. And at the bottom is um, all fully manual flying, which is decreased SA and increased workload. And what Airbus is saying is, these have different times and places. Use them at their correct times. And as you can see, um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to use all the automation, whereas sometimes it doesn't make sense to use the automation. And sometimes you can go from all the way up here to all the way down here. Sometimes it makes sense, you know, if something's not going right, maybe you disconnect one aspect. So instead of going all the way from the top of the pyramid to the bottom, you go to the third level. Maybe, you know, you go, sorry, the second level, or maybe you go to the third level, but always use the appropriate automation at all times. Understanding the automation and the FMA, Airbus says FMA, flight management enunciator, or flight mode enunciator, always understand the FMA at all times. What is the airplane supposed to be doing? Is it doing what I told it to do? 
You know, if you program the airplane to do a descent in the staying level, looking at the FMA will tell you if it's supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Um, in the case of San Francisco, if they were reading their FMA or their mode enunciations properly, they would have seen that the auto thrust was off and they would have been able to rectify that situation. And the last one, but not the least important, is take actions if things don't go as planned. When you see that you're in a situation, it's not working out, it's not going the way you had desired it to go, take appropriate actions. And I think if, if we follow all of these rules, these are the Airbus golden rules, but if we follow all of these rules, I think it will make us better pilots as well, but it will also make us better pilots in automated uh, situations because regardless of the amount of automatics in the airplane, it's still uh, an airplane. So some of the things that you can do, these are things that you know, I you know, try to incorporate. My SOPs support it. Um, so for anyone else who's reading this that belongs to another company or another school, use what um, is appropriate to your level of SOPs. I know some companies are reluctant to allow their employees to take off automation at certain times. We have a little bit more leeway at Air Canada. But when it is feasible, fly with the autopilot off. Nothing sweeter than you know, when the, the environment allows for it to be able to actually fly the airplane. At the end of the day, as pilots, we love to fly. It's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Um, fly without the flight directors. You know, I, I can follow lines just as well as anyone else, you know, but if you fly without the flight directors, it, it creates that muscle memory for attitudes, for power settings, um, for things that happen in the aircraft that you're not going to feel and know and understand, um, you know, when things go wrong. Because as we've seen, automation tends to fail at inopportune times. If you're going to be super stressed about flying without the auto auto or the flight directors um, when things have gone south then that's a bad time to be practicing whereas if you can do this on a nice clear day when everything's going right it makes handling those emergency situations a lot easier and uh, take the auto thrust off you know on the airbus the auto thrust system does a lot of work airbus actually uh, encourages us to use it a lot of the time but it's important to fly without it on sometimes um, and probably the most sensitive throttle system you'll use in your life, but having the ability to use that, again, creates that muscle memory for power settings and, and just how the aircraft feels and how you put the thrust in and take it out and just gives you a better feel and understanding of the aircraft. As I said before, ensure you consult your own SOPs because I don't want to tell you to break anything that's against the rules that your airline or operator has set out. But these are some of the things that I think are key to us existing in a world where I feel that pilots will be a part of for the foreseeable future. With that being said, I think we can easily talk about some of this tech without feeling threatened that our job is going to be taken away or our passion is going to be taken away. So um, I have a couple videos here and then a quick conclusion, we're done. And we can, you know, maybe have some discussion until uh, we're, we're, we're uh, at our time limit. But here's some cool future tech. The first one is Emergency Autoland. Um, this takes Autoland to a next level, adding some autonomy to it. And then the second thing we're going to talk about real quick there is the uh, Airbus Autonomous Taxi Takeoff and Landing. So just a couple more videos and then we're all through with the presentation. The story of Sears Aircraft is really one of historic innovation and constant evolution. For well over 30 years, we've really been crafting technologies and solutions that define and redefine what we have come to call personal aviation. Sears has become synonymous with safety, and our engineers, our world-class engineers, have really outdone themselves this time. They've created a product that we believe is going to change personal aviation forever. I think we all think about the future of aviation and autonomous flight and when's that day gonna arrive when I just press one button and the aircraft taxis, it takes off, it flies me across the country and lands at my destination. And we're not there at this point in time, 
but we've taken a step in that direction. One thing that every pilot and passenger is looking for every time they hop into an aircraft is something that makes them feel safe. We had this amazing opportunity to get our hands on our field demonstration aircraft. And I want to take you along and show you this amazing game-changing technology that we call Safe Return Emergency Auto Land System. Safe Return, very simply, is a safety system where if for any reason the pilot's ever incapacitated, a passenger can land the aircraft with just the touch of a button. Emergency Auto Land activating. So just after the safe return button was touched, the vision jet turns into an autonomous vehicle. Once activated, safe return transforms the screens on the Perspective Touch Plus flight deck to screens that are useful for a passenger. The next thing Safe Return does is it uses its global terrain database to identify the nearby terrain and figure out the best path to avoid that terrain. And it's not just terrain. The Safe Return system uses satellite data link to navigate around potentially hazardous weather. Once Safe Return's identified the potentially hazardous terrain and weather nearby, it then uses information uh, like fuel remaining, winds aloft, and winds on the ground to select a suitable airport. And once it selects that airport, it uses additional information to select the most suitable runway. Not only is Safe Return taking care of the aircraft, it's also taking care of the passengers. And it's announcing over the audio system how much time is remaining, how many minutes are left until that aircraft touches down. The Safe Return system also automatically squawks the emergency squawk frequency 7700, which begins the response of the emergency services vehicles at the airport of intended landing. It's just incredible to watch the Vision Jet roll itself out onto final approach on the right speed, on the right course, with the gear and flaps down, with the stabilized descent all set up. And of course, none of this would be possible without the Vision Jet's auto throttle system. So it's been using the auto throttle throughout this entire safe return process, and it uses it as it slows down and prepares for landing. Once the flaps are down and the gears down, line right up on the center line for that runway, and it begins its slow, stabilized descent into the airport. As it gets closer and closer to the runway, the Vision Jet uses its radar altimeter to compare that with the GPS position above the ground, and we have a remarkably precise number that shows us exactly how high we are above the ground as we're coming in. And just as we get over the runway in the right spot, the safe return system reduces the throttle and puts the aircraft automatically and autonomously into a flare, holds it just above the ground, and the aircraft touches back down to the ground. Once the aircraft has touched down, the safe return system begins pressing the brakes, slows down the aircraft, and brings it to a complete stop, allowing the passengers to open the door and exit. From now on, if they need to, with just the touch of a button, passengers can land the vision jet. Safe return is this incredible technology that adds another layer of safety to the vision jet. And that's now become part of this larger total safety solution on the vision jet, which includes the Cirrus airframe parachute system, unique to Cirrus aircraft, which is the ultimate backup. Maybe once or twice in your career, you get this opportunity to work on this amazing game-changing technology and the whole team here at Cirrus Aircraft has had that opportunity again. From day one at Cirrus Aircraft, we've always been looking to the future, innovating, figuring out new ways and bringing new technologies to aviation to make it more efficient, safe, to bring more innovation to the aircraft. Safe return is a first step down that path to autonomous flight, and I can assure you the entire Cirrus Aircraft team is going to be leading the way. So what do you guys think about that? It's crazy. It, that plane is uncrashable. Like, well, technology. I the concept, but at the same time, like thinking that passengers can, like, I mean, you can't always trust all of the passengers, you know, because like, suppose like get up and go and touch something or, you know, like, yeah. you can't just leave exactly. it to them. Yeah, I, I think, I think um, the, the, they're really stressing that this is emergency use only. Um, and that's a that's a big deal because uh, I think I was flying with a pilot um, about six months ago, seven months ago. Uh, he was saying that they were testing this, and it essentially like blocks off the airspace. 
right? Because with the emergency auto land, you have this autonomous uh, vehicle and it's on 121.5 making these broadcasts, right? So um, yeah, if, if someone does that inadvertently or does that um, just, just because, I, I think there would be some very severe fines attached because it really disrupts the airspace a lot. So, but it's all technology, Demar. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Powered by Garmin. So what they did, they basically tied in the autopilot, the auto land, the auto braking system into mm -hmm. the GPS. Because um, I don't know how many people here are familiar that basically with the G G1000 and the G3000, you can basically fly the plane from, from the taxiway all the way to the next taxiway. We're just pushing the buttons. Um, so what they did with this one, they just tied it into the GPS. And once you hit that button, it activated the emergency ADSB, all emergency codes, and then the GPS takes over the autopilot system and flies the plane to the nearest point. Um, it uses the GPS terrain warning system. Um, it's an old technology, but what happens with these technology, they always test it in the military and non-commercial world. Um, it's being used in drones for the last two years. Um, whoever owns a drone, or you can just press return home, or if the battery died, you can just hit return home and it comes back. Um, yeah. Amazon has been testing the technology with the drones as well. And um, they, to answer the question earlier that you asked, the pilots will not be replaced. Um, however, highly skilled pilots will not be required in another decade. Um, and that is because Boeing has been testing the single pilot cockpit for the last decade. And Airbus has been testing pilotless cockpit in the last two years. Um, there, there are some success. And the military also has been testing a lot of pilotless battle vehicles. And if anyone is familiar with the wingman, the yeah. autonomous Love drone, wingman. yeah, the autonomous drone that is um, basically can be the, the fighter pilot wingman. And then for those who are really into technology would know that they've been using the um, 5G network to basically remotely pilot the aircraft. Um, I think they did a test with a caravan and something else. So, they are doing these things with the anticipation of the future with, with more personal um, air vehicle where you may have it in your yard like a car, got into it, press a button, it will take you to a destination. Um, however, they will not make it pilotless for commercial transportation because the fact that these machines can fail and can kill people. Oh, absolutely. But this technology here is basically, um, when I said old, I mean, I know about it a long time. Oh, yeah. But um, it has to be proven, and then the developers have to sell it to the buyer who's Absolutely. willing to put it in an aircraft. When I, when, I, when I was at Western back in, I graduated in 2007, but uh, while I was at Western, I flew uh, Diamond DA-40 with G1000 in it. So, and this is a variation. The G3000 is a, is a variation of, uh, of that same system. So you, you, you flew the G1000 and you know you just turn the knobs and the plane would basically descend to the ground following the GPS, right? Well, I flew a very early version of it, but mm -hmm. it was at the time it was, I didn't, I don't think we had auto throttle on ours. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was still manual in that respect, but as compared to flying the other airplanes with this more simplistic autopilots, it was the more most advanced uh, autopilot. I remember talking to airline pilots back then that said what I had in the G1000 was more advanced than what they had in their airplanes, which was shocking. So, and that's the thing, the GA um, technology is getting to a point now where it's, it's super advanced, especially with respect to weather and satellite weather, um, uh, this, uh, Garmin Autoland uh, system that's available, some of these displays, the augmented um, vision system and synthetic vision system and all of this stuff that's being introduced into these airplanes. It's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. I'll play this video real 
quick and then so this is taking it another step so this is on the commercial level um, this is with Airbus and it's called ATOL uh, it's uh, autonomous taxiing takeoff and landing and the claim to fame with this one is it's a vision based system so the sensors and you'll see in the video um, are able to actually see and have an algorithm that they create to steer the aircraft based on what they're, they're seeing. Um, if you dig deeper with Airbus, they say that this is a, a part of their, their future that they're testing and they confirm, or so they say that um, this is not intended to replace pilots. Um, it is, pilots still will remain uh, the center of this technology. Um, it's just to reduce uh, the workload in some of these congested uh, areas so that, again, um, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, that pilots can always have the ability in, in dense situations to always focus on the bigger picture and be more so of a manager than an uh, actual hands-on operator. Yeah, Mark, before you play oh. the video, there's a question in the chat from Jordan Robinson asking, about the previous video, um, once you press the emergency button, you can't go back to the regular flight controls. Like, uh, no, I think it can be disabled. Um, it, it can be disabled if it's if it's engaged uh, automatically. In terms of the details, I'm not too familiar because it defers. Um, the the video that I showed was Cirrus's adaptation of it called Safe Return, but it's not only available on Cirrus. The core technology is Garmin. And it's also available with Piper, uh, Dahar, De and uh, some, uh, I think Pilatus is introducing it as well. So all these different um, uh, aircraft manufacturers will have different interface for it. But I think, and don't confirm uh, that from, from this, but I think that you have the ability to disable it at any point in time. All right, cool. I'm not seeing any other questions, so you can continue with the other video. Okay. So just watch his, uh, his uh, left hand there. You'll see that he doesn't uh, use the stick. And you can see the algorithm data here where it's using to steer the airplane and keep it on the ground. See, there's not pulling back on the stick. Airplane's rotating. That's a joke. What? <laughs> So that's that's on the A350-1000, which is a test bed for a lot of this. Um, so pilots obviously for that system are still required to be there. They got to set the power. Um, they have obviously the, the reject stuff that they have to deal with and um, always the worst case scenario, but you can see the airplane did the full rotation, climb out all on its own. Um, can I answer the guy who asked about his safe return question? Yeah, go ahead. Once you press the autopilot disconnect or disengage button, the safe re um, return system is disengaged. So that's how you, um, because you're basically disengaging the autopilot, it turns it off. Um, but the emergency situ situation will still be alerted. So then the pilot will have to call in and say why it was advertently or inadvertently um, activated. Yeah, and, and the thing is that, like uh, what people need to realize with that system as well is whenever there is anything on 121, Point five. Uh, if we hear an ELT, if something like that happened, like it is so critical that we report it. We're as airline pilots, we're always listening to 121.5, um, always listening for any distress signals or anything like that. So it, it is a very, very, very big deal. And I, I, I hope that the system is used for you know safety and to help solve the issue of pilot capacitation. And I hope. Uh, you know, people who are buying this airplane, it's not uh, misused by their, their passengers. 
So I'll conclude here and then um, uh, open up the floor for some uh, questions if you have any. I know we've answered a, a few, but just wanted to make a, a few points here um, in that the perfecting of uh, technologies and the culmination of these improvements will eventually uh, lead to better and more advanced systems. Um, as computer technology becomes cheaper, lighter, and more reliable is an inevitable that new processes and automated sequences will make their way into flight decks. We saw that today with many examples. Um, will we see a fully automated uh, flight deck in our future? Uh, I think absolutely. And um, a good example of that is we literally just witnessed NASA and SpaceX successfully launch, dock, and uh, safely complete a splashdown uh, with a Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon capsule this spring and summer. And the technology, uh, seeing it on that pl platform, you know that it certainly exists for applications in uh, commercial aviation. However, and we've hinted uh, with this along the whole presentation, as with the SpaceX mission, I, I see the role of man, uh, and I put human in brackets because I don't want to offend anyone, securely uh, nestled in this equation for years to come, at least well over the span of our lifetime. So for all of those budding aviators out there, keep your heads up high because uh, I, I believe strongly that there is a, a still a bright future in aviation uh, that includes us. So uh, I, this is a very broad topic. There's so many aspects that we can discuss and, and dive into, but I hope that in you know what we discussed today is able to tickle your brains a little bit, answer a few questions, and give you guys some perspective on automation, its use, and, and the future. Damar, on your point about jobs in the future I wanted to ask you like a generalized question because I personally want to know like I, I want to get into the line of aviation personally but I personally would prefer to work for a company like Airbus than fly the plane myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you would think is the best way to go along I don't want to do a degree like would you say be a pilot first then do it like then apply for Airbus how do you say it's the best way to get a job like that well, the absolute best way to get a job like that, um, and I'm biased, so please preface everything I'm about to tell you with my biasness, um, is to join the military and go to test pilot school. Um, so, yeah, literally, go to go to the military. Uh, I know a guy. A guy. Yeah, uh, that's right what now. I would want to be the test pilot, like, like that guy in the serious video, test flying those planes. That looks. Yeah, funny. yeah, and I know someone. Literally, he was at, at my squadron, and uh, he's an engineer by trade. Um, he's a pilot. So the thing is, with any of these jobs, um, you get more respect if you have street cred. Um, and when I say street cred, if you if you've flown in the operation and you understand the operation, um, you know what the airplane needs to do, you know what makes it mm -hmm. better, um, what can improve, you're gonna be that much more suited for that position by someone who's, I, 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 I talked about William Languishy in, um, in this, these, the article with the 737 Max and he's a great author, don't get me wrong, but when he starts pointing blame at some of these pilots and oh they should have done this and they should have done that and it's simple and blah 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 unless you are a pilot and you have street cred and you understand what it is to be in that situation what you have to say means nothing to me and I don't think it's valuable whereas if you if you are an operator you've flown the airplane you've flown the equipment so you go to military then you go to test pilot school and then you go on to do that I think it just adds such a a great uh, a layer to your resume that makes you because it's one thing to have a, a PhD in something like that, but to actually know the feeling of flying. Man, you can talk. Hey, we can talk. <laughs> we that's can a talk. PhD. That's a PhD in of itself. Yeah, having the can, flying experience. We can talk. We can talk about flying all day long, and we can talk about the Airbus and its systems. Guaranteed. Put someone brand new in an Airbus um, simulator uh, right now and you don't assist them on how to fly the airplane, they're gonna crash it. A fully automated airplane and they're gonna crash this airplane. It's one thing to talk about it, but doing it, seeing it, breathing it is something completely different. And I think when, if you can put yourself in a position, if you wanna be uh, one of those test pilots, if you can um, put yourself in a position where you're an operator uh, and get, and get that, that street cred and do it, I think uh, you'll, you'll be much better suited for that job. And I think you'll get more, more respect from your peers as well. 
Okay, I have a question. So I know that they can, and I know that self-driving cars can be hacked. Is this also like considering, I mean, this is kind of broad, I guess, but <laughs> can the planes also be hacked considering you're going to be using more computer systems and all of that? Uh, well, the thing is, I, I've never experienced my airplane being hacked or, or anything like that, but there's really very little in terms of inputs that people can uh, do for my plane externally. Um, my aircraft can talk to maintenance ahead of time, so they know exactly what's going on, but in terms of them being able to manipulate controls remotely, I, I don't have that aspect on my airplane. If they do introduce something on an airplane, um, which they have in drones and stuff like that, we've seen that. We've seen where um, a few years ago, the Iranians were able to hack a U.S. drone. Um, so that is a possibility and that's something that needs to be uh, discussed because if you're, once you're, once you open the connection where controls can be manipulated from outside, which I'm not saying that commercial airlines have that ability to manipulate controls. I've only seen it happen with drones. Um, hacking becomes a real issue. Um, you know, we've seen a lot lately in the financial world, um, in the privacy uh, part of things where you know, every month or two, you see, oh, this big company uh, information has been compromised. You have to reset your password and do this. So it's, it's a real deal and it's something that really needs to be discussed because there's very little tolerance for it in aviation, um, especially if, you know, terrorists can get access to that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. And that's why they'll have a human on board to flip a switch and shut the computer down. Mm -hmm. The, um... Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Demar. Usually these systems are, are in triplicate, right? Yeah, exactly. They used to be um, duplicates. Now they're triplicate, right? It, yes. Some systems are triple. Um, so like for our, like our aiders, triple. Um, a lot of our sensing equipment, triple. But then, you know, like our autopilots on the Airbus, we only have two. So yeah. some are, du uh, are duplicate at minimum, but in, in most cases, uh, or sorry, I'd say duplicate in most cases and triple in some cases. And then you see that redundancy built into like hydraulics, you know, or engines or electrics and stuff like that. Like it has to go really, really far. I think even electrical system on the airplane is like a four part redundant system because each engine is a generator. The APU is a generator. Then you have the rat, you have batteries. So there's, there's a whole layer of safety built in. I would like to share an experience I had um, where a pilot came from, from one of the elite flight school in Florida and he had all the ratings in the world and he was very highly recommended. And when it came to flying in the seat of the pants without all the automation of the G1000 and all the other stuff, he really couldn't do it. He really couldn't do it. Every time an instrument failed, he just didn't know what to do. He froze up or his GPS battery went out, he just started to panic. So, um, and when they, the 737 Maxis crash, um, a lot of it came back to me where some of the pilots become so reliant on the technology to do the work that when they are asked to do the work by the technology, they literally forget how to operate. And um, it, often cause the aircraft to crash or something catastrophe to happen. Um, with the same 737 MAX store, I remember a few other pilots had the same incursion and they quickly deactivated the system and pull out the trim and retrim the aircraft. Um, I guess the scenarios were different. They weren't on takeoff, but um, literally if you allow the computer to do all the work, you'll become so lazy and so unfamiliar with the work that you can put yourself in a passenger risk. And as if they allow the computer to do all the work, the computer itself can, can have a fall and put the passengers at risk. So oh, absolutely. And, um, for the next decade or two, I don't see commercial pilots being replaced, but I can say um, general aviation will have a lot more pilotless vehicles, but that is because people will be taking a personal risk so Absolutely. we cannot Absolutely. stop automation, neither autonomous um, vehicles from happening. It's no, it's, new it's reality. Inevitable. 
it's, it's inevitable. But then you also have like the insurance case because, um, uh, and I didn't really discuss it because I, I didn't want to make the presentation too long. But um, another important aspect is there are planes right now that are certified, certified single pilot, but they fly them with two pilots because of insurance purposes. So, you know, some people make the argument, can we go down to single pilot? And I think, okay, so what about those airplanes that are certified single pilot, they fly with two pilots? Um, I think for a company, um, yes, pilots can be expensive and yes, you want to reduce uh, air crew, but we also have to recognize that if any of this technology goes wrong or if you're flying with single pilot when you could have flown with two and something goes wrong, they have a lot of questions to answer and it will be a lot more um, of a liability and a, a lot higher of a cost answering those questions than just, you know, mitigating uh, ahead of time. Hello? Everyone's still there? Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Um, oh, there was a, a question again by Jordan asking, as a Jamaican citizen, is it possible to be a part of the Canadian military flight program? And if so, could you inform me about the avenues I could possibly take? So he's a, so he's a Jamaican citizen, not a permanent resident in Canada? Right, that's what he said. Yeah, so um, the, 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 the easiest answer I can give you, um, a lot of this information has changed because I, I left the military back in 2017 and things have changed dramatically since I've left. Um, and I also enrolled way back in 2004 when a lot of the requirements were different. But as a general rule, you, you need to be a citizen of, of the country uh, in order to be a pilot, not to be in the forces, but in order to be a pilot, just based on uh, some of the security requirements, whatnot. There are exceptions, and I've heard of exceptions where you can be a permanent resident, um, but for the most part, and as a general rule, you need to be a citizen. Um, best way to get that is um, if you go on online and you go to Canadian Forces Recruiting Center, they'll gladly take your call and answer that question and give you a very specific answer. All right, cool. I hope that's was sufficient for Jordan. Um, if you guys have any more questions, now is the time. All right. All right, so we're just gonna close off. I mean, truly this was a very intriguing discussion considering the advancements of tech over the years and both the advantages and disadvantages of automation and what can we look forward to in the future so it was really really interesting i mean every all of the questions i was asked all of the topics really in interesting stuff and i want to thank you damar so much once again for giving a time and sharing your knowledge to all of us for yes another informative and engaging presentation i know for sure jaffa's always look, look forward to you presenting because you bring a lot of interesting topics and clarify any questions for professor short so thank you so much again i yeah, want to thank no everybody i want to thank everybody for joining and participating we hope you you have gained some some new knowledge on the topic or or built on existing knowledge and our social medias are on the screen right, right now so follow us keep up to date with what's going on and participate in our daily activities that we have online so thank you all again for coming for joining for participating and we hope you have a great sunday so, thank, thank you demar thank thanks you. for having me guys have a great sunday guys you awesome. too okay, goodbye everyone bye, -bye. You, take care all right bye everybody bye bye